I would like to welcome all the devotees and guests to this wonderful chance to hear from His Holiness Radhanath Swami. His Holiness Radhanath Swami is a very senior disciple of Srila Prabhupada, initiating Guru in Iskand, and has spent a lot, many years here in Vrindavan in some of the early days, and is now uh, preaching basically all over the world, and has established a very nice community in India. Mumbai, Chapati, and has a very beautiful eco eco village farm, Govardhan, New Govardhan, outside of Bombay. His devotees have organized a wonderful hospital to serve the people of, of India, all devotees, staff, and they travel even into villages and help people with uh, eye camps. And so many wonderful things are going on. And Mars has inspired so many uh, devotees and non-devotees all over the world with his preaching. He has a beautiful heart and is full of love for Krishna and all of Krishna's hearts and parcels. <laughs> so to be able to be here tonight and to hear him chant and to hear his speech is a very uh, great opportunity. Thank you all for coming. Let's welcome Maharaj with a large Haribo. Haribo! A larger Haribo. Haribo! Even one larger Haribo. Haribo! Go Linda Chaya Chaya Go Pala Chaya Chaya Namaste Saraswati Devi 
a day in one place and meditate. You didn't have to, but that was encouraged. And I was enthusiastic, so I tried to do it. And sitting in one place for 18 hours a day, when the course was over, I was enthusiastic to walk. <laughs> didn't matter where. I didn't have shoes, and I just walked. Block after block after block. And then I saw a big sign at a stoplight. Mumbai is very crowded. In 1971, it wasn't so crowded. Now it's 15 million people. You know, these big signs advertised a spiritual festival at a park. And the park was right just a block away from where I was standing. So I went. And it's a long story, but there was about 40,000 people, 30,000, whatever it was. And somehow that was my first meeting with Shri Prabhupada. And he invited me personally to come every morning and every evening for his classes for the next 14 days. So I learned from my meditation center every morning because the retreat was finished and I walked over and spent the whole day with the devotees. And actually, I hadn't eaten any food in, in about one and a half days. <clears throat> so I was hungry. And I was just, just turned 20 years old, so I had really enthusiastic appetite. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard that they were feeding, they said this the night before, they were going to feed free prasad or free spiritual food that morning. So I was definitely on time. I went to Srila Prabhupada's lecture. He spoke in Hindi, which I didn't understand. But I, was, I got to sit next to him, so I was happy. And then it came from prasad, and there was probably a thousand people lined up for this prasad. It was halabha. There was a huge pot of halal, which is the most <clears throat> favorite traditional Indian sweet. And it was hot. The pot was smoking. And the fragrance was filling this giant tent. And it was making me more enthusiastic. <laughs> but the line was very long. It was probably about 40 minutes standing in line. And as I was getting closer, the fragrance was becoming more irresistible. <laughs> and I finally came to the front of the line. And this devotee had a big clay cup. He was giving everyone a big scoop about this big of halibut in everyone's clay pot, cook up and give it to them. And he handed me this clay cup. And it was so warm, and the smoke was coming off it. And it was, I was really enthusiastic. It was in my hand. And suddenly, this devotee grabbed it out of my hand. <laughs> and said, you're not going to eat this, are you? <laughs> and I said, it was my intention. <laughs> and he said, no, you're not going to eat this. And then he gave it to the next person in line. <laughs> and now I was out of line. And I thought I had to go back to the end. And there was about 2,000 people in line by that time. So I 
I was... I was like that. <laughs> Inside, outside, I was trying to look like I was a great sadhu yoga. <laughs> I was confused. You know, what type of hospitality is this? <laughs> And then he, he just, the same person, he was a big person, he just took me by the hand and pulled me. He said, come with me. I didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> so there was a stage under this gigantic tent. And he took me backstage. And he sat me down. And there were these two, like monks, sitting there. Subal and Shamsuddha. And they were just sitting there and he made me sit next to them. And seconds later, Malati Devi appeared. My first sight of her. <laughs> she was, this was in 1971. So she was a little younger. <laughs> and she had this little baby running around next to her, Saraswati. She was listening. She ran up to me and she grabbed my hand. This little baby. And I and she said, Do you know who Krishna is? <laughs> and I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just looked at her and she had kind of blue eyes, yes. <laughs> anyway, she had very bright eyes. And she was looking up at me, like smiling. Do you know who Krishna is? And I said, who? And she said, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And she ran away. <laughs> Three different vegetable preparations, some cheese, and it had um, jalebis and halwa and chutneys.
to you with personal and confession with the whole time. And Yamuna Devi, who just wrote a beautiful book. Actually, she wrote a she was asked for years and years to write an autobiography. But she didn't want to write an autobiography. But because so many devotees requested devotees even who she loved and respected, she decided to write her memoirs of Sri Prabhupada. And she spent several years writing like this. And for those of you who know Yamuna Devi, she was very meticulous in everything she did. She, her singing was George Harrison of the Beatles. He considered her, her voice so divine. The first time she ever met George. What was that, Battersea Street or something like that? Where you had, yeah, that, that was the first time they actually had a little apartment that they lived in, in London. Previous to that, there were three couples and baby, husband, husband and wife, as a warehouse. But previously, they were all just living anywhere, wherever they could be. Sometimes in cardboard boxes from refrigerators, that was their rules in the winter. And eventually they got this apartment. And Shamsundar Kuru and Mukunda Maharaj, they had met the Beatles and invited George to come for Prasad. So he came and Malati Devi, Amuna Devi, Janaki Devi had prepared a wonderful feast of Prasad for George Harris. And when Yamuna Devi came to serve him, he told her, Your singing is celestial. You have a divine voice. I'm very moved by your devotion. And she said, You never heard me sing. How did you ever hear me sing? And he told her, that the devotees used to sing at these little clubs in London. <clears throat> and because the Beatles were the peak of their career at that time, if they went anywhere in public, they would be mobbed by people. George said if he was in a restaurant, people would run in and grab his sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> They practically couldn't do anything. But he said he would disguise himself totally with all kinds of sunglasses and other strange costumes. And he would disguise himself to go to the kirtan to hear Yamuna Devi sing. That was how much he appreciated her voice. And he told them, I want you to make a record. They made a record in the Apple Record Studios where the Beatles were born. And George produced it. He played the guitar on it. Paul McCartney was doing the mixing in the control room. And Malati was playing gongs. Malati <laughs> Davy. <laughs> and, and everyone was singing. And Yamuna Devi, she sang this song called the Hare Krishna Mantra. <laughs> she did. She did. But especially hear her voice. 
and that voice became the number one hit song in all of Europe. And after that, the, the Radha Krishna Temple, that was the name of their band, they became so famous. In fact, Sean Sumer, who is writing his book now, and he's really a researcher. He's done so much research. And he, he went back into the archives of all of these different uh, newspapers and televisions. And you, you played on Top of the Pops. That was the number one show in all of Britain, where they would get the topmost rock and roll bands to play. And Sean Singer went to their archives and found that the Radha Krishna Temple played was national TV. It showed around Europe, too. They played five times on national television. It was in my here. I read this lady from For those of you from this era, which some of us have to be from that era, on one show, this is what level the Radha Krishna Temple was on as far as popularity. On, on this national television show, the band before the Radha Krishna Temple was called The Who. And the band after was Credence Clearwater Revival. <laughs> So we're actually in that level. And Malati's just there playing her Malati baby playing the garden. <laughs> and little baby Saraswati's going like this. <laughs> and I'm going to do this. Like the goddess of devotion. So she writes in her books in this beautiful book about her memoirs. And she told her dearest friend and God's sister, Dina Tarani Devi, that if I leave this world, you please finish this book. And then she left. One morning, or in the evening, there was a beautiful kirtan, and Yamuna Devi was singing her best friends. And then the next morning, Dina Tarani Devi came to wake up the deities, and she saw Yamuna Devi sitting, sitting upright with her japa mama, her chanting beads in her hands, with a totally serene look on her face. She was gone. Krishna just took her so gracefully just the way she would want to go. So then Dina Tarani took all the many, many manuscripts that she was working on for her. And when Dina Tarani Devi told me that she told all these stories, but she took herself, herself out of every story. She just talked about Prabhupada and all the other devotees. And she said, and she would say, and one devotee said like this. <laughs> it was her. <laughs> so her friend had to, she had to put her back in her own auto. <laughs> <laughs> and she would tell me about Malati Devi's devotion. She was, she was so deeply inspired and impressed. Enlightened by her devotion. And Prabhupada made Mamati Devi his cook because 
in any circumstance, she can make a wonderful feast. No complaints. Because she was almost traveling to various places in India. Sometimes they would just be on a train. Right? They're on a train, over packed with all kinds of people. In those days, you can't imagine what an Indian train was like. And they didn't just let anybody cook there. You know, you had to kept the, the kitchens were filthy. <laughs> and they weren't grammatical standards. And they didn't let just any person cook, but somehow or other she would get in there and she would cook a whole feast for Prabhupada. Right on time. And sometimes they were on a, a bus going through these potholes, old village Indian roads, like old bus. And she cook, set up a little cooker and cook a piece of the roll. And sometimes she was all alone. She had to do all the shopping and just, just to get them. She'd have to cross rivers with the rowboats just to get some food. To cook, and when she she had to get you know, either cow dung or gas or something, and monkeys would attack her, and dogs would attack her, or she'd just be in the middle of a field. lesson in life, whoever we are, whether we're little swamis, or whether we're little students, or whether we're billionaires or millionaires or corporate heads or mothers, whatever our situation, material nature will always create impediments that are often beyond our control. And that's so nice. Because in that situation, we have to adjust our consciousness. We can't expect the world to adjust to us. Because it won't. And when it does, it's only setting us up for a big surprise when things go our way. And real happiness on a spiritual level is not in any way, shape, or form about how things go our way. Some people pray to God that things go their way. And if things really start going their way, we think, just see how God is answering you. Which was always in his day. When things do go our way, we should know for sure. happiness is when things go completely wrong and we carry on with our enthusiasm. And we find in Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, Chaitanya Charitamrita, this is the lesson of the great souls. Little Prahlad, when he was being just a five-year-old child. He was being persecuted. People were trying to kill him, torture him. 
His greatness is how He responded. With a grateful heart, He turned to Krishna, knowing Krishna's there. Whether there's birth, whether there's death, God is there for us. To turn to Krishna. Krishna is in his name. In those difficult circumstances is what Krishna sees. Sukha dukata. In happiness, distress, honor, dishonor, pleasure, pain, health, disease. Whatever it may be, we could be distracted by success as much as failure. One of my dear friends, his uncle is a multi-billionaire. But when things didn't go his way, how he suffered and suffered and suffered because he's so accustomed to controlling things. But when he can't control it, such frustration. I know people that they in shanty houses where their roof is just um, vegetable oil cans flattened out and they just put them together for the roof. Do you see those in it? This one little room and some bamboo poems and a wife and husband and five children in that little room. I mean, as big as this little corner. And there's about 10,000 other little rooms like that all over it. <laughs> that other people live. And they're happy people. They're actually really happy. I've seen my brother. I've given the chili to them. <laughs> because they're not trying to be controllers. As long as we think we're controlling, we have to suffer. And then if we start blaming people, and we start finding excuses and criticizing. Can I tell you one little story? I was just speaking at this place at the London Business School. It was a talk called TEDx. You may have heard of that kind of thing. And this lady who was speaking after me, she was 85 years old. And she told her life story. She only had 12 minutes to talk. They have like a big clock that you put in front of <laughs> But then afterward, there was this banquet for the people who spoke. And she drove me. She had a really nice car to her. I was kind of like a hitchhiker again. And she picked me up. And we, she told me the rest of the story. Would you like to hear? Her father was a top lawyer in Austria, and he became a judge. And her mother was a very, very educated lady who was also professional. They lived in a very um, elegant part of Austria in the capital city. And then it was inevitable that soon the Nazis were going to invade. They had already more or less conquered Austria. Her family was Jewish. And they were starting to exterminate the Jews and put people in concentration camps. So the people were out. They really had nowhere to go. So there was a campaign 
which is the only country that was really somewhat sort was England. They hadn't yet conquered England. So there was a campaign of the parents for the, for the people of England to legally adopt their children so that they could send them to England. Because they couldn't go unless they were legally adopted. So 3,000 kids were adopted from Austria. And the parents, the girl was five years old. Now she's 85. But this was 80 years ago. She said she was five years old and her sister was eight years old. And the parents, mother, father, they said, we're going to send you on a really nice holiday. And you're going to have a lot of fun and you're see so many nice places and they're going to meet really good people and they were trying to get her really excited for this trip and the girls were well, what about you you're not coming with us no no we're going to send you we'll come a little later now there's going to be some beautiful people your family's going to be waiting for you and she says but what about you and they'll we'll come a little later but they were excited to go because they were telling me about all the sights and all the nice things then they get to the railway station it's the day to go and they see 3,000 kids there, and all the parents are crying pathetically. And suddenly, their own mother and father just break down crying. Totally broken. And the children are broken hearted. You know what a five year old child was like? She didn't know what to think. And they said, yeah, We'll be there soon, just go. They put them on the train. There was like 12 adults taking care of 3,000 children on a massively overcrowded train. It went from Austria to the Liverpool station in London. And during the ride, they're just crammed in with these other children, and they didn't know any. It was the first time in their life they were separated from their parents. Then they get corralled into this big, huge room and the little girls don't know a single word of English. And nobody there knew a single word of German. They're just calling one child at a time. And these girls don't know what's happening. And finally, they call their name about six or seven hours later. By this time, the elder sister is in total trauma. Emotionally, she had been paralyzed. She couldn't say a word. She just shut down and was just looking into the sky. And this other lady, which she was a five-year-old one, she was just crying and crying and crying hysterically. She, she didn't know what was happening. They call her name, and then these two elderly people, a husband and wife, they put them in a pickup truck, and they have a little backseat on it, an old truck, and they don't know any English. These poor people were the ones who adopted them. They didn't know how to pacify these children. They are either stunned or wailing, weeping, it was really a culture shock for the couple. They were simple, poor farmers. They took them to this farm way out in the middle of English countryside. They had a little old house. It was the winter. There was no heat. And they couldn't relate because they didn't know each other's language. So this is how she lived. She said she, for weeks, she just cried day and night because she was totally confused and nobody could really explain what was going on. And finally, it was, they kind of adjusted and it was really difficult because 
from affluence to poverty, <laughs> from living in a city to living in a field. Nobody knows you like they had to learn English. They had to understand these are my new parents. They were Jewish. Their new parents were Protestant. A whole different religion they had to kind of adapt. It's very, very strange. And years later, a few years later, the mother escaped to England. But she would, from a distance, look at her children, but never show herself. Because she loved them. Because she was homeless. She was just living in a shelter for homeless people to love her. She had no way to feed them. She had no way to send them to school. This other family was doing that for them. His other family was giving a future that the mother couldn't. And the mother knew if they saw her, they would insist on going back with the mother. So she just looked at them from a distance and cried. This is the way they were living. But that lady, she somehow or other just saw hope and opportunity. And she ended up starting a company. <laughs> and her company, she started a software company in the 1950s. And she became an entrepreneur. And her company was worth tens of millions of dollars after some time. And she's given most of that you know, charity to children who have different types of problems. But she said to, after she told me the story, we're driving in the car together, she said something that really hit my heart. Because at this event at the London Business School, it was all college students arranging everything. She said, I love to be with these young people. She said, I don't like to be with elder people. I like to be with these young people. And listen to what she said. She said, because they are not so jaded by life. Simple thing. But it hit me. Because I started thinking, actually, I'm really jaded by life. I didn't realize it until she just said it. <laughs> what does it mean by jaded by life? When you're young, you're hopeful, you see opportunities, you, you you can easily kind of adjust to situations and move forward. But the way the world is, whoever we are, where, whatever we've accomplished, this world just beats you down. Yes, it just beats you down. Honor and dishonor, happiness and distress, pleasure and pain, and so many people betray us. So many people hurt each other, and we read the news, and we see what's going on all over the place, and we see what's going on right near ourselves. And the tendency is we become very cynical. We become very sarcastic. We don't become very... Our innocence, our hopefulness is lost because we're jaded by life. And it's quite a miserable state. Why most young people are not jaded by life? Because they haven't been around too long. <laughs> That's all. Wait till you get older, you'll get jaded. Because <laughs> the world does that. 
We don't have to. It's, it's a choice. What was her life? Even when she started her business, she was persecuted like anything constantly. Because she was really out of place. She was against all odds in every way. But she decided not to be jaded by life. Because she decided to always be focused on the positive opportunities that will be there. And when we read Srimad Bhagavatam, we read about people like Prahlad, and Truva, Ambarish, people who, so many reasons they could feel betrayed, they could feel um, cheated, so many reasons that they could feel things are just not this, why is God doing this to me? But they chose in those situations an eternal soul beyond all this. Krishna, you're my shelter forever, and I'm grateful for that shelter. Where there's gratitude, there cannot be cynicism. Where there's gratitude, there's hope. Gratitude in the ultimate of all hopes, which is within us forever and all around us. It's Krishna's grace, Radha's grace. If we tune into that grace, there's infinite hope in our life. There's infinite reason to move forward. There's infinite reason to spread completely positive spiritual energy everywhere. And even when Srila Prabhupada would speak about the miseries of material existence, he would speak about them not just to make us depressed about the miseries of material existence, but to give an impetus. Yes, there is something beyond this. This is a reality. Let's face the reality. Because it's really depressing when you're really thinking that this material existence is so good and then it isn't. See it for what it is. It's a place where everything's always changing. And look for the spiritual essence with it. I just read a beautiful verse from Bhagavad Gita. And Srila Prabhupada explains what is Krishna consciousness. He says, in simple words, Krishna consciousness is to see that everything is Brahman. Because everything is coming from the Parabrahman. Everything is coming from Krishna. Therefore, everything that exists is spiritual. And when we forget that the purpose and the goal of everything is to reconnect with Krishna through our love, through our duty, to connect with Krishna's love, And we try to exploit, control, and enjoy things separate from our true spiritual identity, then there's a cloud. This cloud of illusion blocks our ability to see the beauty of everything that exists because it's Krishna's. in Detroit, I told this simple story. It's a story that's in the journey home, this book that I wrote. Uh, when I was sitting on the bank of the confluence of the river Ganges, Yamuna, the the place is called Prayag. It's considered by, in the Ramayana, Lord Ram said it is the king of all holy places. The river Ganges is flowing, and I can't, I went on a third class plane train for free. Very crowded. No ticket collectors can get it, and that's why it's free. <laughs> and when I got out, I had no shoes, so I was barefoot. 
the sand was like fire. And I was told, you know, you just go down the, the Yamuna bank and you will reach the place where the Sarasvati comes up and the Yamuna comes up. So I was walking, it was so hot to say. Because it was the summertime. It was May, the hottest time of the year. And the Indians used to say during the British regime, only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the new day summer sun. Well, I guess I was an Englishman, so I guess I was a mad dog. <laughs> But I was walking, and it was really hot, and it was scorching my feet. And when I got to this incredible holy place where these three rivers meet, because it was so hot, there was no one around. I was the only one. So I sat to meditate. And I was thinking, I'm going to go in the rivers. And just then, it was a hawk. A gigantic hawk. Day. 
swimming upstream, swimming downstream, swimming across stream. Probably with his friends, maybe his family members, and they're just, you know, looking for some food and eating some food and playing in the, in the rocks and, and, you know, going for the seaweed and just going about their life like every other day. And at the least expected moment, he was just ripped out of the life he knew. And uh, it was a very common kind of a event to see. We see these things all the time. If we're just conscious of it. But I was reflecting, what am I supposed to learn? Like that little fish, we all go about our life in our routine ways. But we don't know. At any moment, the yellow-eyed hawk of fate could rip us out of our routines. We, we read about it in newspapers or on the internet. We hear about it. We've seen it's happened to our friends and relatives. Sometimes it's even happened to us. But still, we remain so complacent. The Srimad Bhagavatam tells, Padam Padam Yadvi Padam Natesha. That there's danger at every step for anyone, whoever we are, whatever our situation. I heard a story about a man who was considered, this is a few decades ago, he was considered one of the healthiest people on the planet, clinically. And he was giving seminars about how to be in perfect health by one's diet and exercise. He had a whole regime for it. And after giving a talk in California somewhere, he was walking back to his car and he slipped and broke his head and died. He was only like in his 40s. I know people in their 90s who've been smoking cigars and drinking stuff. And <laughs> we just don't know. Whatever arrangements we make, certainly we have to try our best to do the best, but it should be on the basis of values, on the basis of true ideals that we're living for. Because at any moment, whoever we are, that hawk of fate can change things. But the best lesson I learned was if that fish was swimming deeper, the hawk could not reach it. If we go deeper into our own spiritual understanding, into our own Krishna consciousness, if we actually begin to taste the sweetness of the holy names of the Lord, if we actually take shelter, then whatever may come on this physical level, it cannot touch the quality of our life. I often remember when I was with His Holiness Bhakti Chaitanya Swami Maharaj in Gita Nagari. He was dying of cancer. He's a saint. But still, the body goes through what it goes through. But what makes him a saint? There's a saying that whether you believe in God or don't believe in God, you're still going to die. So what's the difference? But there's a difference. <laughs> There's a difference of what's happening inside. It's not that taking to a life of devotion frees the body of death. It gives one the realization of the eternal soul which is beyond death. I was here at Newton Dollar giving during the Festival of Inspiration. How many of you have been to Festival of Inspiration? And 
and I was supposed to speak on a Sunday morning. I was supposed to speak Sunday afternoon. And I got a call Saturday evening from Bhakti Tirtaswar. He said, my doctors say I'm going to die in three days. I'm going to leave my body. I'd really like to see you before I leave this world. So I went to Malati Devi and I went to my Prabhu because they were kind of the organizers. And I said, I really have to go. So they said, well, why don't you give the morning talk and then you can leave after your talk. So I did that. And at the end of my talk, I told everyone who attended that I'm His Holiness Bhakti Chirita Maharaj is about to leave this world. He was an African-American person from Cleveland who just came from the ghettos and became one of the most powerful authors and, and speakers and with such realization and love. So I told everyone where I was going. Then I got in a van and drove off. And I looked in the rearview mirror and almost everybody in the festival was in their cars and vans coming also. You remember that? There was probably a hundred people in there. And we all drove to Gita Nagarin. Should I continue the story? And there were so many different kinds of people. We all went into his, there was a event outside some of us spoke and we spoke. And it was presented as these are his last words to the world because he's going to leave within two days. So people were really, really, their hearts were so open. And afterward, there was a meeting in his room. It was incredible. There were people in that room that were really bitter people. A lot of issues that were really troubling them. People with some real faith um, issues. Because I knew many of them. And as he was sitting there, he was emaciated. He had tumors all over his body. He had one leg amputated. He was just sitting on his little chair, smiling and speaking. And as he was speaking, every I was in rapt attention, weeping and crying, everyone, even me. And he finished talking. I saw every heart totally transformed. With hope. With gratitude. I came back in the room after everyone was there and said, Maharaj, how did you do that? I've never seen that happen before. You transformed everybody in a matter of minutes. And he smiled. He said, you see how nice it is to get cancer? You can do things like this. <laughs> he said, I could never do this before. He said, people never listened to me the way they listened to me before. He said, it's worth it. He said, the only reason I'm here is to serve people. If I could serve people better in this situation, it's wonderful. It was blissful. Okay. And he meant it. He said, I'm so grateful. I get to serve in such a special way. So the next morning, I went to him to say goodbye. The last week. And I had really a busy summer. I had um, lectures in colleges and lectures in companies, and I had lectures in, in so many places and so many temples and so many meetings. So I had to leave. And I went to say goodbye to him. And I sat next to his bed. And when I was just about to talk, he smiled. He was laying down and he said, 
I want to die in your arms. Stay with me. As long as you're alive, I'm with you. That meant three days. <laughs> but it lasted eight weeks. <laughs> so I was there with him for eight weeks. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. <laughs> what was beautiful is we made an agreement. Because we knew every day that we were going to meet together and talk and share our hearts, it would be the last time we were ever together. Because it could pass any day. And he said, let us speak exclusively those subjects that bring us closer together. waste a single moment on any other subject because it's just when you know you're going to die soon it really doesn't matter whether it's that Democrats or Republicans are in power all that really matters is how am I connecting with Krishna's grace So there's a beautiful story in the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita about the great Saint Madhavendra Puri when he was on his deathbed. And he spoke a particular prayer that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said was the crushed jewel of prayers. It was the prayer that Sri Radha was offered in separation from Krishna when he left for Mathura. So we would, we began each day when we met, I recite that prayer and we would discuss it for hours. And it led to so many incredible stories, so many exchanges of hearts, exchanges of our hearts and of our lives for that purpose of helping each other to go deeper into our love for Krishna. We spoke about forgiveness. We spoke about determination. We spoke about letting go of so many things that just hinder our progress uselessly. We spoke about the suffering of other people in the world the suffering of other devotees in the world, how we can make a difference for them. In our life and in our death, we spoke about Krishna's beautiful pastimes and Lord Jane Kanye's pastimes and our services to Prabhupada and our gratitude. Everything was just filled with gratitude. And something happened during those eight weeks. I got a glimpse of the spiritual world. How to the degree human beings could love each other if we just put our egos aside and put the love of God as our connecting purpose. It's incredible. There was such love and such trust between us because it was just about Krishna. Putting Krishna in the center. And so many experiences happened during that time. But I'm going to end with one that I love to tell. Because it so much reminded me of the lesson of that fish. One day, the pain of his body was so strong that his entire physical form was trembling. The pain had gone 
to the depths of his bones and his muscles. It was so intense. And as I was speaking to him, he was sitting on a chair. I could see he couldn't focus. He never cried in vain. I never heard him complain in the pain. He was just barren. So when I saw he couldn't discuss anything with me, I just started chanting the mantra. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. And as I was chanting, I was just, I wasn't singing, I was just speaking the mantra like Japa out loud. And he started speaking it with me. And after a couple minutes, something incredible happened. His face blossomed into a supernatural smile. Did you ever see a supernatural smile? <laughs> it's just beyond this world. Because his face is dark and his teeth are white. He was an incredible smile. He was smiling. It was practically to his ears, his lips. And his eyes glistened. And then torrents of tears of ecstasy poured from his eyes. Smiling, shaking his head. He looked like he was just the happiest person in creation. And then he took my hand and squeezed it hard. <laughs> and said, it doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> His body was still trembling from the pain. It didn't go away. But he was, his consciousness was so deep. It wasn't dependent on the pain going away. It was somewhere else. He said, I wouldn't trade my place for anyone else in the world. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm tasting Krishna's name. Today I am tasting Krishna's name in such a special way. It's so sweet. I wouldn't trade this experience for anything. And he smiled and looked at me with such confidence he said, I know where I'm going, and I'm ready to go. And he meant it. He was deep in the current of grace. And that's where our real happiness is. Our real happiness is on what we find within ourselves when we can connect to Krishna's infinite love for us. And we can connect to our love for Krishna. There's nothing within the world that can disturb that if we go there. And Srila Prabhupada explains in this beautiful purport, Krishna consciousness simply means to go there. And then what, as we're going there, we realize how everything in this world is a divine gift if it helps us to find our eternal self. And Krishna, in his beautiful names, in his many names, is always there to give us shelter. Malati Devi is an example of just trying to please Krishna and Prabhupada, your Guru Dave, in any situation. The example of that lady, her name is Dame Stephanie. Do you know what a Dame is? In Chicago, it means something very different. <laughs> but in England, a knight is called sir if you're a male. And if you're a female, 
if we are given knighthood, only the Queen of England could give knighthood. It's the highest um, honor given to a civilian, is knighthood. Not like day and night, it's like the knights. And the woman who gets knighthood is called a day. So she's, she was given this highest honor by the Queen of England. Why? Because even though, when we compare our sufferings to her, when she was a five-year-old child, what she went through, she just saw positive opportunities in how she flourished through every aspect of life. And if we add that spiritual connection to the eternal soul and to Krishna's love, Bhakti Tirtaswam, his disease didn't change, but he was, he was beyond it. We are all beyond it, because we're all eternal souls. We're all eternal lovers of God. And when we share that love for each other, we have a community. Above and beyond all the various <coughs> superficial differences, because there will always be storms. There will be, always be reasons to disagree. There will always be reasons to fight. There will always be reason to be arrogant and envious toward one another. That's inevitable. If we're expecting the environment to change for us to have deep relationships, it's not going to last long. Individually and collectively, we have to go beyond all this.